Welcome to Central Christian Church this morning. We've got a lively group this morning. It must have been all the hot dogs and pretzels and stuff we ate from ETSU yesterday for the ones that were there. We welcome you here this morning. If you're visiting, my name is John. I'm the Involvement Minister for Central Christian. I'll bring the announcements this morning and we'll go to our worship. Uh, Daniel and Rachel are heading out of town on vacation. We have some serious static. Um, so Shelly and Veronica is going to lead us in worship this morning. So be in prayer for Daniel and Rachel as they head out of town for vacation. But a big thanks to the ones that worked at ETSU yesterday. We had a great time, uh, fellowship, hard work, uh, reaching out in the community. I thank you for everyone that worked that. Some of you guys have asked how much we've brought in revenue-wise from ETSU. We have not got any report yet from ETSU for that yet. So as soon as I get that, I will uh, disperse that out in an email. Will you turn that down on Channel 7, please? Um, don't mute it. Don't mute me. But thank you guys for who worked yesterday. We really appreciate the hard work. Remember this coming Saturday is a Storytelling Saturday. If you've not brought your coolers or crock pots in yet, please do that this week. Uh, put your name on them with masking tape or some type of label so we know whose crock pot is whose and whose cooler. We also need about 50 dozen of cookies and brownies, uh, Rice Krispie treats as well. If they're really large ones, uh, save those for my office. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, put those in a single bag. If they're smaller ones, put two in a bag. And just bring those to the fellowship hall sometime this week. We need them by Saturday and just lay them on the counter in there. If you need bags to bag those, we do have bags available for that as well. Uh, we will have parking spots reserved for workers on Saturday uh, with cones. Uh, so when you come in to, to work your shift or the time you're here, just move the cone, put it on the sidewalk. When you leave, please put that cone back out for somebody coming in to work the second shift, unless you're just here all day. When you leave, just bring them into the building. Uh, October 28th, uh, Jonesboro's doing a Halloween uh, festival uh, event for kids. We're going to be handing out Halloween candy uh, from 6 to 9. We need about 2,000 pieces of Halloween candy. If you can start maybe bringing that in, if you're able to, bring it and put it in the fellowship hall. We'll have a tote in there for that. Uh, but I need two more workers as well to help hand out candy that evening. That's from 6 to 9. We did it back in 2019. Had a great time. Huge engagement with the town. Uh, if you can help with that, let me know. and We'll get you plugged in uh, to where we can use you on that evening. Uh, this coming Wednesday is the first Wednesday potluck. So bring your favorite dish. Come share some uh, great fellowship and food. After potluck, we're going to set the uh, fellowship hall up for storytelling. So if you could plan to stay after about 30 minutes. Is that about right, Deb? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to say many hands make easy work. So if you could help with us to get the table set up and chairs, that will be great. We'll be in and out quickly if we have enough people to do it. Uh, the elders meeting was canceled last week, so it's going to be this coming Tuesday at 4.30 at Summit Leadership. So if you wanted to attend that last one, you can attend this coming one uh, at 4.30. Uh, the item of the month is uh, spaghetti noodles for JAMA. So if you could pick up some spaghetti noodles in a box, they can be the large ones or the small ones. Just place it in the basket at the back door. JAMA really appreciates that uh, food donation that we get each, each month from us. We thank the ones that helped uh, work JAMA this past week, too, on a fifth Thursday we're normally not that busy but we serve 22 families and I think 50 people total several new clients came through to, to get food so there's a need out there so we appreciate all your help with that uh, the prayer of the month is for future growth in the youth as a youth minister for Central I, I come to you open hands to ask for prayer for the youth I think God wants youth here but I think we need to be praying for him to send them if it's his will and his timing so be in some prayer for our future growth of the youth in the community, for outreach events that we're going to try to do in the future for youth as well. Uh, I'd appreciate it uh, personally just for the, as being your youth minister. And the mission of the month is the Nelsons, which are in Papua New Guinea. If you read some emails, they've just suffered an earthquake of like a 7.8 magnitude. So be in prayer for them as they're recovering from that and as they continue to share the gospel as well. We'll go to word of prayer and we'll begin our worship service. Father God, we thank you for the day. We thank you for everything you do for us. We thank you for your presence here, Lord. And I, I thank you for everyone that's came to worship you this morning. 
our, our, our congregation family, our visitors we have this morning. I pray they feel your presence here. Lord, help us worship you with truth. Open the open heart. Help us focus on you, Lord. We give you all the praise and all the glory for everything you do in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, family of God. We're going to lift our voices in song and praise. If you would like to stand, if you're able. Our first song this morning is Come Christians, Join to Sing. Come Christians, join to sing. Alleluia, amen. Loud praise to Christ our King.
opportunity to come here in this place to worship you freely. We don't take that for granted, Father, ever. Father, we ask that you bless upon this service. And Father, we ask your blessings upon all those folks uh, that are affected by the hurricane, uh, especially those people in Florida and the, the coastal areas there. Um, we ask your death blessings and provisions to them. In Jesus' name. Time for children's worship. Isn't it great to know that we have a God who's for us? Amen. A God who's always with us. A God who never leaves us alone. A God who always cares what's going on in our lives. A God who's done everything he needs to do to make sure we get to go to heaven and spend eternity with him. That's the God we worship. Shelly and Veronica, thank you for leading worship for us today. One of the greatest things about Central Christian Church is that we have a number of people willing to step up and fill in when those people who normally do these kinds of things aren't here. And so... It's wonderful to hear Shelley's voice again, and I always love hearing Veronica's voice. Daniel and Rachel, I believe, are on vacation. It's fall break, and so they're out of town. But be praying for their safety as they're gone. It seems like it's been forever since I've been here. In reality, it's only been about three weeks, although I preached a couple of weeks ago as I swung into town and swung back out again. We put a lot of miles on our cars these last three weeks. It's been a great experience. i got to tell you, when I spent the few days Veronica and I did down in Savannah last weekend with my oldest sister and her family, we had an awesome time. You know, I just, several of you have asked, I just want you to know we had an awesome time. And although I may be getting old, Shelley, <laughs> I'm not as old as my oldest sister. She turned 80 this past week, and so we were down there celebrating her 80th birthday. Her kids had set a surprise for her, and we had a big, beautiful retreat that we went to, and she had 37 of her immediate family there. Uh, my oldest sister didn't know how to stop having babies, and her kids didn't realize how to stop having babies, and her grandkids didn't realize how to stop having babies. And so there were 37 of her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, along with three of her siblings and our family, uh, there to celebrate her 80th birthday. And it was a great time for me, and I believe for all of us. And as great as that was, and her kids had surprised her, there's six of us siblings in the Roberson family. Four of us were there. The other two were in Arizona, and I was just a little too far, I guess, for them to try to get over to Savannah. She didn't know we were coming. And so they had the whole 37 members of the family standing like if she came in this door, and they were all standing in the back against the back. And they all yelled surprise when she walked in. She knew she was going to lunch somewhere. She didn't realize how big of an extravaganza it was going to be. And after they all yelled surprise, her one daughter said, now mom, we've got another surprise for you as well. And the scene parted, and there were the, the rest of us standing in the middle as we, everybody yelled surprise again to her, and she started to cry, and it was so exciting. It was an awesome time for us. The neatest time, though, of the whole weekend was Sunday. We... We had a cabin that we stayed in all of, or the seven of us, that stayed in this cabin together. And we got up and started to have a worship service about 11 o'clock Sunday morning, I think it was. We were all just sort of sitting around the dining room table doing what I love best. We all know what that is, right? Eating. Eating, yes. <laughs> and we just started a worship service. And we went for about four and a half 
five hours. And not a one of us wanted to get up. It was so enjoyable as we sat there and sang songs that we all loved. We went around praying for each other. My youngest sister from Kansas City I brought her anointing oil, and she anointed all of us. We prayed over everybody. I mean, it was just an awesome time. So thank you for giving me the time off and letting me go to Savannah. They all survived the hurricane. Uh, none of them suffered any damage, so we're thankful for that. We're thankful, I'm thankful, that John can step in and fill in for me when I'm not here. He not only filled the pulpit for me, he taught a bunch of Bible classes too, and John got a lot of experience uh, teaching multiple classes and preaching like he had to do, and so I appreciate that as well. But I appreciate all of you. You know, John mentioned the football game yesterday. Many of you were there, and it wasn't a very nice day, but it could have been a whole lot worse. Uh, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been, but it wasn't as pretty as it could have been either. Uh, so thank you for that. And for those of you who are planning to be here uh, this Saturday to work storytelling, thank you for that as well. That's always a busy, busy day. Those of you who have been here long enough know how exciting that is. And there's plenty to do at Central Christian Church. You know, I, I've shared this with you before, and we'll get to this sermon here in a minute. Uh, <laughs> I've shared with you before, so many times when, when I used to meet with a bunch of preachers on Thursday morning, there were sometimes eight, nine, or ten of us who would just get together, we'd pray together, we would discuss our sermons together, we'd just talk about life in general. And I think it's fair to say that some of them were envious of what we at Central Christian Church are involved with. And I don't say that to pat ourselves on the back or to shoot our own horn or anything, but we do a lot of stuff at Central Christian Church. More so, I suggest, probably than even many of the bigger churches do. And I'm just thankful that so many of you have a servant's heart and want to be involved and want to be doing things. And we, if you remember, John and I preached through Acts chapter 2 some time back, and we noted how the early church met daily from house to house just continuing in apostles' doctrine and fellowship and prayer and, and the breaking of the bread. And they were always together doing something, and I really believe that's one of the reasons the early church did as well as it did. They didn't just get together on Sunday morning. They got together all the time. And they spent a lot of time together learning each other's lives, doing things together, not always in times of worship, but doing life. And I am thankful that we do that here at Central Christian Church. And that we have a lot of people who are just willing to jump in and be engaged and do stuff, whether it's fun things or whether it's work things. And again, Shelly, thank you and Veronica for just stepping up today and leading us in worship. The Lord bless you. You know, I, I've shared this before, maybe when Daniel sang this song the first time, I used to have a plaque in my office from Numbers chapter 6 where this is found, as, as God tells Moses, here's the blessing I want Aaron to give his people, to give my people. The Lord bless you. You know, and we need to be saying that in our lives. We need to be saying that to people we come in contact with. We need to be saying that when we meet people on the street. Several of you, and, and I know Laura is one of them, you know, when somebody says, how's it going, Laura? She says, I'm just blessed by God. You know, or something like that to acknowledge. I have a God who loves me and who always blesses me and who looks out for me all the time. And, and whether life is going well or life is going horrible or life is just sort of drifting along as it does sometimes, we have a God who's always with us, who wants to bless us, who does bless us. We need to be thankful. We need to let other people know how great our God is. We're in Colossians chapter 2. John and I are preaching through the book of Colossians, and we're not necessarily going word by word, but we're going to spend just some time over this past month and the next month to come as we go through these four chapters. The ideal being that we're trying to convince John and myself, and hopefully some of you, that God wants our best. He doesn't want us to just be complacent. 
He doesn't want us to just be satisfied with getting by. God wants us to serve him to the best of our ability. Not because we have to. Not because it's some demand upon us. But because we have a God who loves us. And because we understand to some extent how great he loves us. We want to serve him. We want to honor him. We want to do the things we do because we want to give back to him for all that he's done to us. And John ended his sermon last week talking about how we're to be rooted in Jesus Christ. It reminds me of the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. He's got a foundation that doesn't crumble when the storms come. And as Bob mentioned in Bible class this morning, looking at some of the pictures that happened down in Florida, you realize some of those people didn't have a very good foundation. And even though some of them did, that storm was so powerful it just ripped out causeways. And some people who lived down on the islands had no way to get back and forth to the mainland. And I'm thinking, why are you there when there's a Category 4 hurricane coming? Why don't you get on shore while you've got a chance? But that's not my concern at the moment. The point is we have a God whose foundation will never crumble if we'll put our faith in him. It doesn't matter how big the storm is. It doesn't matter whether it's a Category 4, 5, or 10 hurricane that hits our lives. If our foundation is rooted in Jesus Christ, we can stand firm. We may not like what's going on around us. It may break our heart to see what's happening to ourselves, people we care for, this nation in general, whatever. But if we keep our foundation right, we get to spend eternity with God. And that's the challenge that Paul has given us in the book of Colossians, is to be so firmly rooted in Jesus that nothing else drags you away from him. That nothing else moves you away from being the God servant that he wants us to be. We're going to pick up in verse 8 of chapter 2. Because Paul starts talking about what does it mean to be rooted in Jesus. What does that look like? And what are some of the dangers that are out there trying to uproot us from Jesus Christ? Verse 8 says this. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the elementary spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. This is the only place in the Bible that Paul uses the word philosophy. I don't know that that's important or not, but for some reason, while he was talking about being rooted in Jesus, he warned us about the philosophies of this world. He warned us about things in this world that would pull you away from Jesus. And there's not a one of us in this building that hasn't experienced that. Every one of us knows what Paul's talking about. We've all put our faith in Jesus Christ. We've all believed that God is the creator of this universe. And yet in our lives, something comes along and distracts us. <coughs> and for a fleeting moment, maybe even for a while, the philosophy of this world says, you don't need God. He isn't all you need. There's more to life than this church stuff. You can just enjoy God's favor, but also come over here and just enjoy the wisdom of the world. And that's what philosophy means. It's a love of wisdom. It's the desire to have Something else besides godly wisdom lead us. James talks about that. This wisdom is a wisdom that comes from above, from God. We get that in this book. This is where we learn about it. Let me again plug our Bible studies. We have a lot of Bible studies and small groups going on here at Central Christian Church. You can be here on Sunday morning. You can be here Sunday night. You can be here Monday night. You can be in a Bible study Tuesday. You can be in a Bible study Wednesday. There's a small group on Friday. And we've shared enough with you to know if you simply cannot make any of those, I'll set up a Bible study just for you. I want us to know this book. And I don't teach all those. John teaches some. Others lead others. Some of these small groups that take place through the week. 
And again, I'm thankful that we've got people willing to do that. They open their homes. They take their time. They do all of this to help all of us learn more about what's in this book so we can be the people God wants us to be. The world hammers us 24-7. The world, every time you turn around, is telling you and me there's more to life than God. There's more to life than doing what's right. There's more to life than living the way Christianity wants you to. Worldly wisdom says it's all about us. Just do what makes you happy. Some of us, Shelly, because we're old, <laughs> not you, not you, can remember a commercial that said, you only go through life once. Grab all the what? Just so you can. Bunch of beer drinkers out there. And that's what the world says to us. Grab all you can. It's all about self-satisfaction. It's all about pleasure. It's all about living a life that just fills you to the brim with ecstasy. And you're only going to go through life once, so you might as well just grab all you can. And the world says, grab not only all you can, but whatever you want. There are no rules anymore, it seems like. We live in a world where the, the worldly wisdom says it's all about what you want to be. A three-year-old, they say, has a right to choose whether he wants to be a boy or a girl, or neither, or swing in the wind. The world says, in its wisdom, your own mind about everything. Choose to do what you want to do, and you'll be happy. What's that old saying from the 80s or 90s? Don't worry. Be happy. And the world is just on that. The sad thing is, and most of us know it, that kind of life doesn't make you happy. That kind of life is full of disappointment, and failure and such uncertainty that you're anything but happy if that's the way you're going to live. A life with no rules is no life at all. If you can swing in the wind so much that, as James talks about, the, the waves that toss you back and forth and back and forth and you don't have an anchor anywhere, you're never sure what you're going to believe today versus what you're going to believe tomorrow, there isn't any joy there. There isn't any peace there. There isn't any sense of belonging because every time you turn around, something's different. But that's the philosophy of the world. Live the way you want to. Paul is warning us, don't fall for that. Don't let the spiritual forces of this world distract you from the truth of God's word. <coughs> It's been doing that forever. Started in the Garden of Eden. When Satan came along to Adam and Eve and said, did God say this? <laughs> Who cares? Here's the truth. And Adam and Eve said, sounds good to me. And off they went. And we've been doing that ever since. And church, I gotta tell you, it doesn't matter how strong of a Christian you are. Satan's after you. He wants you. The only thing he can do to hurt God is take you away from God. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God has gone through everything he needs to to make sure you and I have an opportunity to be saved. Satan comes along and says, what are you worried about that for? Don't mess with that. You know, you can worry about that when you're older. I don't know how many more years I've got, Shelly. You know, so some of us better get on ball here and start making sure, you know, we're getting right with God because the truth is none of us know how many years we've got left. But the world says just do what you want to do. Paul says that's not the way it works. Now, as we read through the book of Colossians and as we've been studying Paul's life and some of our other Bible studies, we know that one of the biggest problems Paul had 
were a bunch of Jews that followed him around from place to place. He would go preach the message of Jesus. He's the Messiah that the prophets had told us about. He was the one that's going to come into this world and redeem mankind. And on his coattails would come these Jewish Christians who would say, it's nice that you're a Christian, but that's not enough. You've got to do what the law of Moses says. Because we've always lived that way. And if it was good enough for us then, it's good enough for us now. And you can be a Christian all you want to be. You can accept Jesus as your Savior. But you still got to do what the law of Moses says. And so Paul continues writing in verse 16 and 17. He says this. Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things that are to come or that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And then he goes on in verses 20 and 22, and he says, Since you died with Christ to the elementary spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Paul says it's great that you've accepted Jesus, but why are you letting the wisdom and practices of the world determine whether you're going to be right with God or not? And we have done that in our churches ever since. Haven't we? If you were raised in a church, and looking around, most of you were. Some of you weren't, but most of you were. You can think back to when you were younger in your faith, Whatever church you went to had its own rules on how things were done. It doesn't matter if you're a Catholic, Methodist, Church of Christ, Baptist, Independent Christian Church, whatever. Most congregation you're in has ways that they want things done. And you did it their way or you left. Because some of them were so set in stone you couldn't change them. Didn't matter what the Bible said. Didn't matter if somebody had a better idea. These congregations had their own rules and you did them their way or else they considered you not right with God. That's what Paul's talking about. Man-made rules that people impose upon us to say you can be all the Christian you want to be, but if you're going to really be a good Christian, you've got to do it our way. You've got to make sure you toe the line just the way we want you to. I can remember as a boy... Because I'm old. <laughs> Back in the early 60s, some of you are old enough with me to be reminded of this. The Beatles had hit the scene. How many of you remember the Beatles, right? What was their one distinguishing characteristic? Long hair. Long hair. I mean, give me a head with hair long, but no, we don't sing that song. <laughs> But that's where the rock groups were coming from, right? Everybody had long hair. The, the new guys, they all their hair grew down over their shoulders. And in the early 1960s, I can remember, I'm not that old, I can still remember things. In the congregation I was in, an elder standing up and saying to the church, while looking in the direction of my brother and a few other people in that church, does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace from him, quoting 1 Corinthians 11, 14. And they hammered that passage, and they hammered that passage, and they hammered that passage. And if you were a young boy and you were letting your hair grow, every time you turned around, some <coughs> godly man was saying to you, does not even nature itself say that it's a disgrace? For you to have long hair. And many young men left the church then. Including my brother. Because he couldn't put up with the stupidity of people who wanted to impose their own rules on people. Over and above what God said. Now, my brother's since come back to Jesus, and I'm so thankful for that. But there were a whole bunch of young men way back in the 60s who said, if that's the way you're playing the game, I'm not playing anymore. 
The problem with that passage isn't what it says, it's how it's applied. Because I can be honest with you, I read that passage and I said, no, nature doesn't tell me that it's somehow bad for a man to have long hair. In fact, as I look at nature, it's the male of most of the species who have the gorgeous hair. Tell that to a male lion that somehow he's embarrassed because he's got this huge mane. Tell that to the male peacock who opens up his tail feathers and just glows in the dark. Tell that to the, the cardinal bird. Well, the male is such a beautiful red color and the female compared to him is some drab gray. Easy, Bob. No offense. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> Now try to get personal here. <laughs> but nature doesn't tell us that it's wrong for males to have that glory looking stuff around them. So you gotta figure out what on earth is Paul talking about and it wasn't that. Because people in those days wore long hair, men. Paul's talking about something specific going on in Corinth. What was going on there? Then make, make it a blanket coloring that said, this is the way it is for everybody. But we do that. And some of you grew up in churches where it was told to you, you can't play cards. I grew up in a denomination that made that rule. Couldn't play cards because if you play cards, you may start to gamble. And if you start to gamble, you may lose money. And if you lose money, you can't give that money to God. And so you're taking God's money and gambling with it. And I'm thinking, what's the difference in that and going out and wasting it on a cup of coffee? No offense to you coffee drinkers. <laughs> We're all spending our money one way or the other, aren't we? Every one of us choose how it's going to end. But we make up rules somehow, some way that says, this is wrong, this is right. I grew up in a house where the church taught dancing was wrong. Now, we guys know you put your arm around a woman the only thing you're going to think about is you know what you're going to think about. And that's the way the church viewed it. So in order to avoid that at all, I mean, we did get to do square dance. How many did square dance in junior high when you were a kid? The schools taught that stuff. Some of the churches wouldn't let their kids do square dancing in junior high because that's dancing and we can't dance. That's exactly, I think, what Paul's talking about. And I'm not trying not to anyway malign those people for doing what they were doing. I think what they thought they were doing was a good thing, but I'm not really sure it was a good thing. Because we were trying to impose on everybody else rules that God didn't impose upon us. I'm thankful that we have an eldership here at Central Christian Church that does its best to say we're not imposing rules on anybody that the Bible doesn't impose on anybody. Now we've got some traditions, but they're not set in stone. We don't always have to do everything the same way all the time. And we're open to discussion. We're open to giving you some freedom. As long as we're not violating scripture, we have a sense that you're pretty much on your own to decide what's right or wrong. And what's right for Amy may be wrong for Mary Lou. And Mary Lou may think, I can't do this, but Veronica might think, nothing wrong with that. Paul says in other passages, some things are matters of conscience, and you get to choose how your conscience is going to deal with that. The only thing you can't do is offend or take advantage of somebody else whose conscience is different from yours. But we need to be real careful that we're not letting worldly wisdom decide, here's what makes a good Christian and here's what makes a not so good Christian. As much as I love all of our Bible studies and all of our small groups and all the different things that we do, nobody expects everybody to be involved in every single one of them. You can't be. Not without going crazy after me. So do what you feel led to do. Get involved in the ones you want to be involved in. And if you want to come up with some new ideas, come up with them. But no one's going to look at you and think, well, but you didn't do Monday Bible study and Tuesday Bible study and Wednesday Bible study and Friday small group and you're not here on Sunday morning, you're not here on Sunday night. 
And so we're going to think you're not good enough. That isn't in the Bible anywhere. I see nothing in Scripture that says you're obligated to attend every single thing, whatever congregation you're in, sets up. Don't misunderstand me. I think the things we have going on are good things. And they take opportunities for us to be involved in doing some of these things. Some of you aren't physically able to do some of this. Some of you aren't able to have the time because of your job or whatever else you're doing. You can't do some of these things. We're not going to make a rule here that says every time the church door is open, you better be here or we don't think as much of you as we should. That isn't biblical. We flipped that now. Now instead of making up rules that say, okay, to be a good Christian, you got to do this and this and this in order to live the way you're supposed to, we've come up with rules that say you can do anything you want to and be a good Christian. That it doesn't matter what the Bible says, you can live any way you want to live. You want to marry somebody of the same sex? Go ahead and do it. You want to take all the drugs you want into your body just because it makes you feel good? Go ahead and do it. You want to claim there is no God? My daughter, who went to Boston a couple weeks ago, came home and said, Dad, we went by a, a Christian science church. You realize their preacher doesn't even have to believe in God in order to be their preacher. Have you ever heard of anything so absurd? You can be a minister in a church that purports to follow Christian principles and not believe in God. That's how far we've gone in the opposite direction. We no longer impose a bunch of rules, although admittedly there are some conservative churches that still do that. We've moved so far to the other side that we've taken God's book and said, we don't care what God's book says. We're going to claim to be saved and we're going to do whatever we want. We're going to live any way we want to. Well, in fact, we're going to teach and preach in our churches. You don't even have to be a Christian in order to be saved. You want to be Muslim, you want to be an atheist, you want to be a Buddhist, you want to be whatever you want to be. Be whatever you want to be because as long as you're sincere, everything's fine with me. That's garbage. That isn't what the book says. And what you and I have to decide is, are we going to do what the book says, or are we going to let worldly wisdom dictate how we're going to live and what we're going to believe? The Bible says there's only one way to get to the Father, and that's through Jesus. That's what we need to be teaching. That's what we need to stand for. We do it in love, okay? There are some Christians who think it's okay to act like idiots. That isn't okay. There are some Christians who think it's okay to go bash gay people because after all, they're gay people. And you've all read the stories and maybe even known people who thought it's okay to go beat up on the queer guy because after all, that's what he deserves. That's not right. That, in fact, is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches we're to love people. You're not going to convert somebody to Jesus by acting as worse or bad as they do. You need to love people. And if someone's teaching something that's not true, you need to be bold enough and have enough knowledge of this to be able, gently, with love and all the kindness you can muster, somehow say to them, let me tell you what my God teaches about this. And I care enough about you that I need to share this with you. I don't know why some people are the way they are. Sometimes I don't even know why I am the way I am. So there's no way in the world I'm going to be able to look at everybody in the world and say, well, you're doing this simply because you're a sinner. You're doing this simply because, and fill in the blank. I don't know why everybody does everything they do. But two things I do know. Jesus Christ died for every person on this planet. In fact, God says, Peter writes, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God wants. 
And it doesn't matter if it's the worst, nastiest, ugliest sinner in the face of the earth. God wants that person. That's the first thing I know. He loves me. Why? I haven't got a clue. But he loves me. And in spite of all the things I've done in my life, he still wants me. I gotta tell you, that puts me on my knees at times to think, how is that even possible? Why would God, who created the universe, want somebody like me to spend eternity with him? <coughs> but he does. And not only does he want me, he wants every one of you. But he wants everyone out there in the world too. That's the first rule. God loves everybody. And his son Jesus died for every single one of them. Second rule is this, and he said it in one of his parables. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You and I need to be a laborer. You and I need to be sharing Jesus with people. You and I, when we encounter someone who doesn't believe what the Bible says, need with as much gentleness and love that we can muster, share the gospel with them. Not condemning and judging them up front, not looking at them and thinking, I don't want you in my church. I don't want them on the same pew I'm on. Instead, we need to look at those people and say, God died for you. The least I can do is offer you an opportunity to know who he is. That's what God wants Central Christian Church to be doing. And I hate even saying it like that because some of you think, well, yeah, that's the preacher's job. That's the Sunday school teacher's job. That's the elder's job. Not my job. Yes, it is. Because every one of us are Central Christian Church. If you're a member here, or you attend regularly, even if you've never made that formal announcement that I want to be a member here. That's your job, is to share the love of God with people you come in contact with. God set it up that way. He set it up so that people who believe in him will put their faith and trust in him. I won't quit right there. Not because I'm done, but because I don't want to preach as long as John did last week. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> we'll pick up here next week, Lord. Not next week. Remember, next week we don't have services. Next week, find another congregation and go worship. Don't just stay home. And for those of you visiting with us, next weekend is storytelling here in Jonesboro. And the town overflows. There's tents all over the parking lots. The streets in front are closed. You gotta park down at the middle school and take a shuttle to get into town and all this kind of hubbub. They always decided many years ago, we just close the building down Sunday morning of Storytelling Weekend. For a while we worshiped on Sunday morning because Jonesboro didn't have any storytelling going on until one o'clock. And about six, seven years ago, they pushed the opening up till 10, and so now everybody's in town Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, so we don't have services next Sunday morning. <coughs> I shared that with some of the other church preachers I used to meet with. One of them said, you don't go to church on Sunday? <laughs> See, that's one of those rules we've made up, right? That if you're going to be a good Christian, you've got to be in church Sunday morning, every morning. The door's got to be open. There isn't a single Sunday morning worship service mentioned in the Bible. Okay, I'll just tell you that. But we're not having services, but again, I'm not suggesting to you just stay home and do whatever you want to do. Go visit another church. Go down to Westside. Visit with them. Go to First Christian. Go wherever you want to go. Go somewhere, worship somewhere else. Go to some denomination you don't usually go to. Go to a Baptist church. Go to a Methodist church. Go somewhere. And if you don't feel like you can do that, then at least have a worship service of your own at home in your house 
so that we give God the glory. The other reason we did is because most of us are just worn out Saturday night when we're done. And it's tough to get up Sunday morning and go. <coughs> so if you're visiting with us and we're planning on coming back, which we hope you will, don't come next Sunday morning. <laughs> One last thing I'll say and then I'll quit. One of the Bible studies I was in this last week online brought up Hosea chapter 12, verse 1. It says something like, Ephraim, chase after the wind. It's a condemning chapter. Talking about the tribe of Ephraim that was going after all kinds of stuff, primarily human wisdom. It, later on it says, and they ate the wind. And the commentary in that chapter says, have you ever sat down and enjoyed a good meal? Every one of us said, oh yeah, we have. Many, many times, some of us. More times than probably we should have. Imagine how satisfying eating the wind would be. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound very satisfying <clears throat> at all. Open your mouth for lunch today. Bite the air and see how full you get. That's what chasing after worldly wisdom gives you. It's unsatisfying. It doesn't do you one bit of good. But if you'll go after what God has to offer, he'll not only satisfy you, he'll fill you up. Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. That's what he wants for you and for me. To live a life dependent on him. Because that's the only anchor that matters. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you, Father, that we have been able to assemble here peaceably with joy and love and, and spend this time with you. And God, we're not done yet. Thank you for this nation. Thank you for the opportunities you give us every single day. And Father, my prayer would be for every one of us that we'll not let the wisdom of this world control us or turn us away from following your truth, but that we would seek your wisdom and we would follow your teaching, knowing, Father, that if we do that, we're rooted in Jesus. We're anchored in against the storm and you are faithful thank you for blessing us thank you for being the God that you are we praise you in Jesus name amen we don't ever close a service here again it's one of our traditions not a biblical command but we do it because we want to give you an opportunity we're going to sing a song and we're going to give you a chance if you would like you have some prayer requests you got some praises going on in your life. You know, I love hearing the praises so many of you bring Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Things that are going good in your life. Things that are happening that are positive. Because we need to do more of that. We need to hear about how God's blessed you. And hearing you share those stories lifts me up. Makes me realize what an awesome God we have. So maybe you just got something like that. Maybe something else going on in your life. Some friend of yours, family member, whatever that you would like us to pray for or just keep in our minds. We're, we'll do that. We'll take as long as we need to do. But as we often say, there's no magic coming down front. You can lift up that prayer and that praise to God where you're at. But if you'd like to share it with us, come do that. Bob will be up here to take your requests, your comments, and we'll pray about those after we're done here. Let's stand and sing.
mic is on. Can you hear me now? It's hard to hear you? <laughs> you know, uh, God is so good to us, and uh, he protects us even when we don't know, know we need to be protected. But we got a lot of prayers, so if you'll bow with me this morning in prayer. I asked John. Did Oh, I'm sorry. Please pray with me. Father, uh, we are so thankful to you for just allowing us to be here this morning. God, we got, we got several praises, and, and uh, I'm just going to start out, Lord, by thanking you. Thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you for uh, your creation that we see every day. Thank you for even the power uh, and the storm, uh, Lord. I mean, it, it just a, it, it shows us that you uh, you are God. You have power in this world, and and uh, God, we thank you for those who were protected uh, from the storm. Uh, at the same time, that uh, many uh, many weren't, uh, and we don't know the answers to all of that and why that happens that way. But but God, we know that we're thankful. We're thankful that. Uh, Casey's uh, friends down in Fort Myer uh, that uh, they had their lives, but they lost their uh, their their belongings. Uh, Fort Myers was was hit hard, and and uh, the the devastation that we saw there, Lord, uh, we just uh, pray that you be with them in the midst of their uh, uh, of their recovery of the rebuilding uh, process down there. Lord, we thank you that uh, Samantha's dad uh, and uh, uh, Julie's. Uh, daughter Alyssa and, and, and grants their grandson uh, stayed safe and, and and came through and and uh, father give uh, Samantha's dad uh, a safe trip he's coming up this way uh, keep him keep him safe Lord uh, father uh, we we also thank you that uh, that uh, Mary Lou's uh, mother and all the others in the uh, nursing home that were bust from where they were to uh, out of harm's way uh, that they were all safe and now they've been returned to uh, the uh, their original uh, housing uh, and uh, nursing home and, and uh, God we just give you praise for that uh, God uh, we thank you that JW was uh, uh, approved for further uh, physical uh, therapy Lord uh, he's struggling and, and God we just pray that you'd help him get through that uh, and that it has uh, a positive uh, effect on him. Uh, God, we thank you that uh, we can open up our church next uh, next weekend, next Saturday, for uh, storytelling. And, and God, just uh, go before us and, and bless uh, bless the way before us, we pray. Uh, Alex prays that Brian's here today. He, he missed him, and uh, we, we, we've missed him. And we thank you for bringing him back today and, and getting through uh, what was keeping him from here. Uh, praise that uh, uh, Alex has a new boss coming. He doesn't know him yet or her, uh, but uh, we pray that you would uh, just pave the way for that to be a good, uh, a good working environment for all all concerned. Uh, God, we praise uh, praise you that uh, Alex's friends Chase and Allison uh, have found a house and and it's uh, it's under contract and and things are going through on the whatever it has to do with the loan and so forth and. We just uh, thank you and praise you that they'll find the church. And uh, if it's your will, Lord, uh, we'd love to have them here. God, as I say that, I thank you for the visitors here this morning. We thank you that uh, that they uh, they found us, that uh, uh, one of the couples told me that they were re recommended uh, by someone to come here. And we thank you for uh, who the, who that person was. And we thank you that they, they were able to find us, Lord. Uh, and God, uh, at the same time, we uh, we give you praises. We have uh, uh, we have prayer requests, Lord. We have a good friend of ours that is uh, was just diagnosed with several uh, 
serious uh, health issues. And we pray, Father, that you would watch over her, that you would give her strength, that you'd be with the doctors, that they would uh, be able to make the right decisions for her care, Lord, and, and that you would just give her calmness and peace to know that you are God and you are in control. And, and uh, we, God, we just uh, thank you. Uh, one of the praises that I missed, Lord, is that uh, Janice and Gerald Wilson, Leah's parents, are here with us this morning. Uh, they came up t to uh, give a special thanks to their church that uh, that we have uh, welcomed Leah in, and, and uh, she is uh, now part of our family, Lord, and, and we thank you for uh, blessing us with uh, with her, and, and uh, thank you for those who uh, were over at her house uh, cutting down trees and, and uh, doing some things in, in the rain, I might add. Uh, Lord, and, and we just thank you for, uh, for those, uh, those that were out there helping her uh, in her time of need, Lord, because that's what family does. That's what we're about, Lord. Uh, Father, uh, I also want to lift up my niece, Arlene. Uh, she's got some serious health issues going on right now, complications from her diabetes, and, and uh, she is in ICU and uh, up in Michigan. And, and God, I just pray that you be with Arlene. Father, touch her body, heal her, be with the doctors, Lord, guide them in their in their care for her, and, and be with the family, and comfort each one of them, I pray, Lord. Father, uh, I, uh, I thank you for, uh, for Eva and her diligence, thank you for the injection that she had, uh, and she wants to thank uh, our church for, uh, uh, for our prayers, and the doctors for their knowledge and, and their care for her. And uh, God, it, uh, as we talked about in Sunday school, Lord, you know every one of us. You know every inch of us. Doctors know a lot, but they don't know everything, Lord. And that's why we pray. And we pray and ask you to uh, touch and heal us, Lord. Uh, Jim has come forward, and uh, he asked for prayers for his brother as he lost his uh, son, Michael, on Friday. Uh, I, don't, I didn't catch how old, but he was he was fairly young, I think he said. Uh, so be with his brother, Lord. Be with Jim and, and help him to be a comfort to his brother, Lord. And, and Father, I just uh, I pray that you put your hand, arms around him and, and uh, just give him your peace, I pray, Lord. Um, and uh, Jim also prays for uh, safe travel for, uh, for his daughter, who, uh, Leslie, who is on her way uh, coming across country to, to to Tennessee, I think, and uh, to visit him. And God, just gave, give her a safe trip, we pray, Lord. Uh, let's see. What was it? Father, a friend of Amy's uh, had a brain tumor. Uh, has she actually had, has had multiple brain tumors. One was operated on, the other one is going to be operated on, uh, Lord. And we just pray that you would uh, be with her and, and guide uh, the care for, uh, for t treating her uh, brain tumors, Lord. Uh, Amy is having a, a, a biopsy this week. Father, we pray that uh, it, it comes back with, uh, with good results and, and that there's no, uh, nothing further that they have to worry about or she has to worry about, Lord. Uh, God, uh, we thank you that Bob's back and he made it back safely. He had a wonderful time with his family and, and that you watched over he and Veronica on their travels to Savannah. Thank you that it wasn't a week earlier uh, or they might have had, had some early uh, issues with that. Uh, but God, we just thank you. And, and uh, Lord, I thank you for all that we, all of our church family and all that we do, Lord, we do in the community. We do uh, for you. We do for this church, Lord. Uh, Jesus, we love you, and uh, we just uh, thank you for helping us to be a blessing, uh, Lord, and, and we just give you all the praise and all the glory for everything that we have, all that you do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Thank you for being here today. We're going to do communion, and our communion, we all do it together at the same time. The night before his death, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to his Father, knowing what was ahead of him. In anguish, he prayed, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. That's from Luke twenty-two forty-four. Jesus the Son suffered and died to take away the sin of the world, John 129, and restore our relationships with God the Father. And that's true. What God did, God Jesus gave to us was his Son. And his Son was able then to go to us to basically serve, you know, serve his, give his life and so on and give us a chance to go to heaven. took up our pain and he bore our sufferings. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. That's Isaiah 53, 4, 5. Thus we worship and show our gratitude for what he did for us and how he can change our lives. And that's true. If you sit and look at your lives, you've been affected by many different things. The things that you've seen in life and the opportunities that God's given you in this life. We are going to celebrate what Jesus did for us by partaking in the communion, which is our positive response for what he did for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16. Let's pray. Father, we come to you to thank you for all we have gotten in this life. We love the Lord, your God, with all our hearts and with all of our soul and with all of our mind. We pray that you would love our neighbors. God's love allows us to change and grow into the person he wants us to be. God disciplines us to help us learn because he loves us, and that's true. He does help us to learn. Jesus' love is an example of what it means to sacrifice and to serve others out of love. Lord, help us reach out to change others' lives. We thank you for the things that you have done for those that have been floods in southeast Kentucky, in Virginia, and also from the hurricane, the things that you're providing, food and so on for people and some help. We do appreciate all that you've given us this life. Everything we see is something that you've created, but we do, do appreciate what you've given us. Amen. do the same thing they did in the, the last supper we're going to basically take the bread and also have the juice and so on what we have up front here is two double cups with the bread and the juice in it and you come in and get that when you come if you come down the center aisle get it and go back outside and so on and get back to your seat and so on we appreciate it anybody that believes in Jesus can take communion and you're welcome to come and we do appreciate your coming and so on okay
the last supper Christ took the bread he broke it he said this is my body broken for you took the cup he blessed it and said this is my blood given for you Do we have a birthday today? Not today. Sure thing. Life goes on, though, whether you're having a birthday today or not. <laughs> we do get older. Some of us are really old. For those of you that don't know, I've been teasing Bob. She can tease me all the time. His whole life, practically. <laughs> and you know, one of the neat things about being old, I can be... <laughs> What? Somebody wonders. <laughs> I was going to say, well, I can be cranky and get away with it because I'm old. But that's not nice, right? We don't want to be cranky. One last prayer request. Uh, Cheryl asked for prayers for her sister-in-law and family that had damage to their house and business in Fort Myers. And certainly, as Bob's already said, uh, that state took a bashing, um, as did to not as bad of an extent, some in South Carolina and North Carolina as well. So. Be in prayer for that part of the country. They've got a lot of work to do uh, to get their lives back to anywhere close to normal. Be thankful. You know, I know they were calling for a whole lot more rain and wind here for a while. Uh, it's sort of a dud by the time we got here. We can be thankful for that, uh, that we didn't suffer any of that damage like so many other places did. I'm glad to be home. Looking forward to being home for a while. I guess it's a good thing we're off next Sunday so I don't have to, like, get back into it too fast and I can sort of build myself back up and to be in here. Uh, but I appreciate all of you. I appreciate everything all of you do. We do have several visitors today. Thank you for being here with us this morning, uh, for taking the time to be our guest. We appreciate that. Some of you I know, some of you I don't. Uh, but we hope you'll have found it today to be a place of worship, a place where you encountered God and hopefully some friendly people and you'll consider coming back and worship with us. We know there's a lot of good churches in our community, uh, but we're glad you chose to be here today. Any other announcements we got? Again, if you're bringing your crock pots and your ice chests for Saturday, uh, please make sure your name's on them somewhere. Uh, you can bring them Wednesday night because Wednesday is what? Hot luck Wednesday. So one of the best times of the, the year for me, the first Wednesday of every month, uh, come eat with us. If you're a guest this morning, uh, come eat with us anyway. Come get to know us, 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall down the hallway to the back of the building. Be glad to have you come join us. You don't even have to bring food if you don't to, but if you're a good cook, bring food. Um, and we'd be glad to let you share your food with us. So come come meet with some of us. We, we have a pretty good time on that first Wednesday. Uh, sit around and talk and just enjoy the fellowship, get to know us a little bit better. Yes, thank you. We also need cookies. Uh, if you can make a couple of two or three dozen cookies by Saturday, you can make them early and put them in your freezer. You can bring them here to the church building. We'll put them in our freezer. Again, if you're going to make those, put them in little sandwich bags or the smaller baggies. Uh, so we'll give them out that way. If you make something with nuts, please put a sign as you bring them to us, a note of some kind that they have nuts in them so we can make sure we notice that when we're serving them on Saturday in case some people have nut allergies. Um, anything else? All right, we've got a great week ahead of us. It went from summer to winter overnight, it seems like to me. Uh, so my wife loves it. Um, I'm already wearing my long johns. Uh, and so uh, just getting ready for the cooler weather. Uh, have a great week. Be a blessing to people. You know, the Lord bless you and keep you, and we need to be asking him to bless and keep others as well. We serve an awesome God. We have a great message to share. Be blessed this week. Father God, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for our lives. Thank you for our blessings. 
Thank you for our chance here to be here this morning. God, thank you for each one that is here. We do add to our prayer request, Father Cheryl's family who suffered property damage and the hurricane. We just pray that you be with them as they and go through whatever they need to to get that property repaired. And God, again, we're thankful that the storm wasn't any worse than it was, although it was horrible for those living in it. But God, thank you that by the time it got here to East Tennessee, that it had pretty well had blown itself out. And we're thankful for that, that we didn't suffer a lot of damage here. And we do pray as we move into this week, God, help us to be aware of what's going on around us. Help us to use the opportunities you give us to share the love you have for everybody that we see. Thank you for loving us. We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed, church. Thank you.